so many people are showing up interest in this. My name is Steve Banners. I was volunteered, as uh, I said, uh, to help out in the defense of the Sino Rabu, uh, the Mon and Albany the Ark, who was charged with terrorism. And at the end of this case, um, I concluded that the government had not only uh, convicted an innocent man, but the government had done so deliberately. And this is a, is a very harsh thing for me to say. After a long career in the law, I had never seen a case like this before. And I believed that something truly unjust had occurred. Uh, we, of course, tried everything we could do uh, to undo this unjust conviction. And I may talk a little bit more about it later. But the thing, I, the point I want to make here is that as time went on, we began to find other cases. Uh, right next door in Syracuse, New York, there was the case of Rafael Lafir. And I remember going over and meeting the support group for Rafael Lafir. And they were outraged just the way we were outraged. They said this man was completely innocent. The government deliberately targeted and convicted an innocent man. And as they began to explain it, we became confused. We said, that doesn't sound anything like our case. And then we explained our case. And they said, well, that doesn't sound anything like ours. And finally, as we began to work on what was going on here, we began to realize that what the government was doing was it was preemptively prosecuting people. And this is a phrase the government was using, and this is something that we picked up on, trying to understand why we believe these people were innocent. The government was saying, in effect, there is a possibility that these people may become trouble. And in the post-9-11 climate, we are simply going to charge them with fake or contrived crimes and uh, convict them and lock them up so we don't have to worry about it. This is so foreign to my way of thinking as a lawyer. I found it very hard to believe. And yet, and, and there was a press conference after the arrest case was over, and the prosecutor was very proud of what they'd done. They framed it essentially in a sting operation in which he was given no information that the thing was illegal in the state. And the press was giving the prosecutor a hard time, and they said, do you think it was Yassin a, a terrorist? Do you think so? And the prosecutor was surprised, and they said, well, we didn't have any evidence that he was a terrorist, but he had the ideology. He had the ideology, and because we were concerned that of his strictest adherence to Islam, he might uh, be sympathetic if a terror, real terrorist came along, so we decided to take him down. So they were very open about it. This was not something uh, that was hidden. Now, as we got into a little bit more, uh, we began to find cases all over the country. And so we formed Project Salam to try to document this phenomenon of the government essentially uh, prosecuting and convicting innocent people uh, to preempt them from possibly committing a crime in the future. And I mean, just as an aside, I was reading an article a, a couple of days ago by uh, someone from the Center for Constitutional Rights who was sort of reflecting that our since 9-11, our criminal justice system has become much more, very close to the Soviet system. If you remember, the Soviet system had no criminals. There were no criminals in Russia uh, because the Soviets, what they would do is sniff out anyone who was a troublemaker and they would arrest them before they could commit a crime. So all the jails were full of political prisoners. There were no actual criminals because they hadn't had a chance to commit any crimes. And that's essentially what we are doing now. That model is what I would suggest, insofar as terrorism and particularly Muslims are going, um, that is the model that the government has been following, although secretly they don't want anybody to know about it. Um, I want to just go through a couple of ways in which they do this. Um, one of the principal tools in the of prosecution is a uh, statute called material support for terrorism. And under that, any support that you give to a designated terrorist organization, even if it is to help relieve suffering, even if it is to help bring peace, even if it is to help the terrorist organization become non-terrorist, all of that would be considered material support for terrorism. If a lawyer were to file a brief 
on behalf of the designated terrorist organization, arguing that the terrorist organization should not have been a designated terrorist organization. That would be material support for terrorism. Um, so it is a very broad law, and this, it has been held that even free speech, advocating on behalf of a designated terrorist organization, if it's controlled in any way by the organization, would be material support. So I just want to look at a couple of quick cases to show you how broad this is. One of the people down there, uh, the Holy Land Foundation, Hassan Alashi, and uh, some of the other directors of that, that was the largest Muslim charity in America, uh, the, the Holy Land Foundation. They were very generous. They gave to all sorts of charitable causes, including Katrina victims and other people. But one of the principal things they did was to build schools and hospitals in the Palestine. And they were charging material support for terrorism. The government conceded that none of the money had gone to help terrorists. But they argued successfully that the money had gone through the Zakat committees in Palestine uh, to help build these schools and hospitals. And because the Zakat committees were controlled to some extent by Hamas, this enhanced the prestige of Hamas and therefore was material support for terrorism. So now a man like Hassan al who devoted his entire life to do nothing except relieve suffering in troubled areas all over the world, was very compassionate, beloved man, is now sentenced to 65 years in jail. Um, now, I, I mentioned Dr. Beard before, over in Syracuse. He was an oncologist who was an Iraqi, and he also was a very extremely compassionate man, uh, had formed a charity to help uh, the Iraqi kids during the embargo a long tenure embargo. Thousands and thousands of children died during that embargo. And so he got food and medicine and sent it over there to try to relieve the suffering. Uh, once 9 11 came, the government went after all the Muslim charities. On the theory, I suppose, that if you're going to give money a lot in the Muslim areas, that uh, who knows who you might be benefiting, you might be benefiting the charity. It's better to shut them all down. So they shut down the Feed the Needy, which was Help the Needy, which was his charity. And then they went after him for material support for terrorism. And uh, there was a big press conference. They announced that the you know, financing of terror was going to be closed down, and the governor made a pronouncement about how awful this terrorist financing is, and so on. And then they suddenly realized that they had no need to charge him. There were no terrorists in Iraq. Saddam Hussein was not permitted. What did they do? They fumbled around and then they suddenly announced, oh, this isn't about a terrorist case at all. It has nothing to do with terror. It has to do with Medicaid fraud. We're going to charge you with Medicaid fraud. Now, in a Medicaid fraud case, uh, that's a, you know, there's usually fake patients or fake medicine. No medicine was given or, or fake patients. None of that was true in the Darfur case. All they said was that it was a misbuilding of the wrong formula. That is, whether or not the doctor was in the office or not in the office. The government asserted that the result he wasn't entitled to any money at all, the whole thing was a fraud, and they got the jury to believe it, to buy it. Once he was convicted, they put him in a special Muslim prison for terrorists, and they put him on a list of successful terrorists that were convicted. In other words, to me, because it had absolutely nothing to do with terrorism in the trial, it's the perfect example of preemptive prosecution. The government decided right from the beginning they were going to find something to charge him with and take him down with. And when they couldn't do it with material support for terrorism, they didn't do Medicaid fraud. They didn't care. But that's the kind of thing that we're fighting now. Um, another thing that they have, uh, another way they approach this is if you haven't done anything that is sufficient to quite charge him with material support for terrorism. They will appoint an agent provocateur to become your best friend and try to encourage you to do something. Uh, perhaps one of the more, well, I'll skip over one of the uh, worst examples of that, I think, is the Tariq Shah case. I don't know, has anybody heard of Tariq Shah? He's a famous jazz player, played the bass, played at, uh, at Clinton's inauguration. Um, but anyway, at some point, uh, the FBI got suspicious of him, so they sent him an agent provocateur down to try to get him to send the money over to a terrorist group in the foreign country. And to reach out and wanted just didn't want to. And so the guy worked on him and worked on him. And finally, the FBI put so much pressure on this, this uh, 
agent provocateur, that he actually went down and set himself on fire in front of the White House to protest the kind of abuse that he was taking from his own FBI members. Well, after that, they appointed another agent provocateur, and this guy came to Tariq and said, listen, could you give me music lessons? I really want to have music lessons. Sure, I have music lessons. After about a year, he says, you know, I haven't got any place to live. Can I move in with you? So he moved in with the guy. And for a number of months, lived in his house while secretly recording all of their conversations and trying to talk him into something that would act as a crime. And eventually, he was able to piece together enough, enough tape recordings so that Shaw was convicted and then now spending 15 years in a, uh, in a, a CMU. So those are the kinds of things that uh, people do. Well, I think perhaps the worst case, am I running out of time? I'm running out of time? All right, uh, I'm going to run out ahead. Um, one of the worst abuses I think that is happening now is something called SAMs. When you are charged with terrorism uh, now, almost automatically, before trial, you are put into solitary confinement. Under the Geneva Convention, someone should not be in solitary confinement for more than 30 days because the, men, the effect on your mind is so dramatic. You deteriorate very rapidly. Uh, you experience panic, you experience uh, hallucinations sometimes. You can, your mind gets very confused, it's hard to talk, it's hard to think, and people describe it as torture. So under the Chief Convention, no more than 30 days. But the government automatically now will put you into SAMs for years. And you will sit there, charged with some crime. And I think perhaps the best case, well, uh, since I don't, I'm running out of time, I'm going to just look at the uh, Orsani case. This was a guy who came back from the Middle East, the FBI wanted to talk to him. The, uh, he, he agreed to talk to the FBI about what he'd seen over there. Then they said, great, we want you to be an informant for us. He said, I don't want to be an informant for you. They said, fine, we'll charge you with lying to us when you talk to us. So they ended up lying, they're charging him with lying. Uh, and then they put him in the solitary confinement. And after quite a long period of time, they were forced to admit that he actually had told them the truth. He had never lied. But they still kept him in solitary confinement and kept trying to find something to charge him. And he was in jail for five years in solitary confinement until finally he was so crazy. He was so mentally damaged that he felt he had to do something to get out, and the only way they would let him out was if he pleaded guilty to material support for terror. So he did, he pleaded guilty to material support for terrorism, whereupon he was sentenced to time served and was released. After pleading guilty, he was no longer dangerous, so they let him out. Imagine that. This is the twisted, warped sense of justice that is going on in this country right now. Um, one of the other things that has come up that has uh, been very damaging is the uh, an idea that because these are ideological prisoners, because they are so dangerous, because they may influence other people and other prisoners, they have to be locked away in a special Muslim prison called a communication management unit that isolates them from the rest of the world. And so that they have created two of these Muslim isolated prisons out in the Midwest, one in Terre Haute, Indiana, and one in Marion, Illinois. I, I visited both of them because I had a visit to see a rat when he was in jail. And uh, they're very grim places. Uh, their uh, phone calls are very limited to 150 call, phone call a week, uh, only a few letters, uh, no physical contact. Against these 
communication management units on the grounds that they were illegally constructed and illegally set up to begin with. And the government, uh, there was a motion by the government to dismiss the lawsuit and it survived that first round of motions and so now it's going to go to the trial. And I just heard yesterday that the scene has been removed from the CMU. This is the government, whenever the government says that they're about to lose a lawsuit, they always move the person. And now they never have a case against them. So uh, there, there's obviously going to be a lot more litigation on that. I just want to mention one more point. How much time have I got? Two minutes. Okay, that's good. Um, I just want to mention uh, one development. Um, another aspect of the whole problem is that there is massive surveillance that goes on all the time. Uh, we don't know if it's under a series of clandestine um, programs, presence surveillance programs. But in all of these cases, and I would say that virtually every one of these people is, is a, a preemptive prosecution case. And if you look at the total sum of all the damage that these people did, not a single person died, not a single person was injured, not a single piece of property was stolen or, or damaged in any way. In other words, all of these people are serving long, long jail sentences, and nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened. I just want to make that clear. But anyway, the government um, has surveyed on some tapes on all these people. And one of the things that developed was that the report was done by uh, to Congress indicating that um, there was no mechanism in all of these secret classified recordings to turn over exculpatory information to the defense. In other words, the government could go through and could take record you and cherry pick it for all the evidence that indicated that you were guilty of a crime. But they were turning over all the evidence to show that you were not, you were not guilty of the crime. And this is, of course, against the law. It's clearly unfair, but it's also against the law. So the government uh, inspector general of the Justice Department has recommended to Congress that they appoint special prosecutors to go through and review all of those cases and another 350 cases that are not on there on the board um, to see whether or not the government failed to turn over the exculpatory material, which would have proved that these people were innocent. And we believe, of course, Congress has ignored the recommendation. So this is one of our big pushes as Project Salam. We want to get this adopted by Congress because we believe if the special prosecutors went through and examined those cases, they would find a mountain of exculpatory material that was never turned over because those cases are all fake and foreign to begin with. People were never guilty. And a special prosecutor could find that out, and that is the way we're hoping to try to get these people released. So with that in mind, thank you very much. I was just handed a piece of paper and told to summarize quickly, and then I'll uh, open it up for questions and answers. So I just wanted to say, uh, it's been a real pleasure listening to these people, and I hope you've got a sense that this is something serious. This is something serious that affects all of you. It affects all of us, and it affects our country. As Americans, we have a right to free speech. We have a right to practice our religion as we think best. And the government should not be telling us how we should do that, and if they don't like our ideas, or they don't like the way we practice our religion, if they shouldn't be locking us up in jail. They shouldn't be isolating us. They shouldn't be putting us in uh, units where we are tortured in solitary confinement for years at a time and we're too deranged to defend ourselves and have to plead guilty. These are all things that belong to completely foreign alien notions of justice. And I hope it will offend you as much as it offends us. There's a famous saying, and I know you've all heard it, but I'm going to repeat it here again because I think it's important. First, they came for the Jews, and I didn't say anything because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the communists, and I didn't say anything because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't say anything because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to defend me. That was said by Pastor Nemo during the time of the Nazis. But in a very weird way, it applies today. That's why, um, Tom, there's no dis distance between us because we see that there's no difference between what they're doing to the Muslims and what they're doing to the peace activists and what they will do to the labor. Um, the National Coalition for the Protections of Civil Freedoms 
He's going to try to attack this uh, on a legislative basis. This is a horrible, horrible time to try to get any bill passed in, in the legislature or Congress, but we're going to try to do it anyway. Uh, we have a couple of them. One is we want to amend the material support statutes to say that you can't be convicted of material support of terrorism unless you intend to engage in terrorism. Duh, right? This is pretty obvious. Uh, it's going to be hard to get through Congress, but this is something you must talk to your individual congressperson about. And I hope every one of you will go down and talk to your congressperson about it. It happens that the Patriot Act is up for renewal in May, and there is a fix that was made by Senator Feingold called the Justice Act. And part of the Justice Act is to correct this material support for terrorism, and so I hope you can tell all of your legislators do not pass, do not reauthorize the Patriot Act until you have passed the Justice Act for the fix. Uh, we would also of course, like the, the resolution on special prosecutors to get all these poor people out of jail for the suffering down the going. We want to have a bill that will stop SAMs. No one should ever have to go to be stuck in solitary confinement for years before trial and they're presumed guilty. What an outrage. What an absolute outrage. And we want to shut down the, the communication management unit. In this country, there is no excuse under any circumstances for ethnic prisons. The only other one we ever did was interning the Japanese during World War II, and we've been apologizing for it ever since. Again, it's an outrage. So those are three things. But the last thing I, I just wanted to mention was immigration. We treat foreign immigrants, undocumented workers, uh, about the same as Muslims. They were put into, once they were picked up, they were put into deportation centers, essentially under isolation and uh, prevented from having adequate legal support, uh, and their families were ripped apart, and it's a simply a continuation of the same problem. So we want to have legislation that will correct that. And these are things I think you need to talk to your legislator about. But most important, there's one thing that is absolutely important, it's the last thing I'll say, and then I'll get on to questions. Um, all of this is driven by fear, and I'm sure all of you out there sense that fear, Islamophobia, and you see people like Peter King out there trying to rev up the, the Islamophobia. It is no longer possible for any of us to remain silent. You have to go out and talk to your friends and your right-wing brother-in-law and your crazy aunt and say, stop it. Stop this is the Islamophobia. Let's sit down and talk about what it really means. Uh, because if we're not willing to speak up, if we're saying we are not Muslim, so we don't have to say anything, we are leading our own self down the path because eventually there will be nobody to speak for the rest of us. And I hope you all understand how really, really important that is. And on that very good note, uh, let me ask you have any questions. Oh my god, I want to have a scare everybody, but we're trying to do that. Yes? Uh, how many of these people that we see here, the names? Like, I know about Samuel Arian that he was released. How many of these are released? Uh, some of them are released. I have to just say, Samuel Arian is not released. He is in the middle of the trial, actually, in a weird way. Uh, he got into the middle of the trial, and then there was a motion made to dismiss on the grounds essentially about Lincoln's governmental misconduct. And the judge, who's a very good judge, took it under advisement and said, while I'm considering the decision, I will release you under house arrest, but you cannot leave your daughter's apartment in Virginia. And she has not made a decision for two years, over two years, two and a half years. So he's now trapped in his daughter's apartment for two and a half years. I in the middle of a trial. I thought he was teaching in somewhere in Middle East. No, and I have to say, I have a, I'd like to call myself a very good friend of Samuel Harry. I, I see him from time to time. Uh, he is a brilliant man, a very courageous man, extremely compassionate man, and one who has the deepest, deepest, best interest of America at heart. And he is trapped in his daughter's apartment, and he last time I saw him, he says, I'm suffocating here. I gotta get out. Most of the people are not released. Uh, there are, uh, some of the very early ones, like the Lackawanna 6, I think have gotten out now. They've just been released. Uh, 
And there's a few others on the board that have got that. And then there's some over there, and I put on the back side, I, I thought the board was a little bit too grim, so I put a few that actually beat the charges in one way or another. A couple, there's a couple of cases in which they were able to get past the charges. And, and so they are, uh, for, for the most part, I would say 85% probably are still in jail, and some of them are like. Uh, the question was um, that since, well, first let me say thank you very much for the point you were making, which is that I've only been talking about Muslims and peace activists, but in fact, the government hasn't been thinking that way. They are also going after environmentalists. Environmentalists are very dangerous people. They've got philosophies. They actually think. And they can do all sorts of damage to corporations that corporations may not like. So they have been ending up in the CMU. Uh, animal rights activists are even worse. They have their own special terrorism statute. Uh, and uh, so they are also been targeted. And I assume that there will be other similar ones like this. Um, it turns out that the way the government is presently structured, you can do almost anything as long as you call it terrorism related. And terrorism, of course, is a very broad, vague concept that's any violence or threat of violence or like illegality in order to affect government decisions. Uh, so blocking traffic in order to make a point about a local law or something could very well be considered terrorism. And I think we'll see more and more of this. More and more groups will be called terrorism groups because that's a lot of money is there, a lot of power there, and so on. And I think the, we have to fight back about that. I, mean, I, I absolutely agree. The, the environmentalists, should be part of this discussion, that these people should be part of this discussion, the Muslims, uh, the animal rights activists, all of us have the same central interest in making sure that the government stops demonizing people who are not terrorists. The question is that there is a no-fly list, and you get put on the fly list based on some sort of a secret process over which you have no control, and if you're on there, it is very difficult to get off. And the question is, is there any procedure, anything being done about it? Um, I can say that the National Coalition for Civil Freedoms, that's down to one of our goals, one of the things that we set for ourselves. We, I believe that CARE is undertaking a special uh, legislative drive for that. Uh, they're the ones that are spearheading the effort to try to bring some sort of a rational uh, resolution to this question of who can be put on those fly lists and how you get off it on there erroneously, but again, it's very hard to get anything through Congress right now. Yes? Steve, would you talk a little bit about the Albany Resolution? Yeah, I, well, I, I had mentioned it earlier. Um, that was the resolution uh, to get special prosecutors appointed uh, based on the recommendation of the Inspector General. Uh, one of the things that we did in, in Albany was got the Common Council to vote a resolution uh, requesting that the Justice Department take up such this, this recommendation or go to Congress to it. And we hope that that will put pressure on Congress. Now, and obviously nobody is going to pay a lot of attention to what the Albany Common Council uh, thinks about things, but they might pay more attention if East Lansing Common Council did something, or um, Detroit, or uh, a bunch of other cities. And we have some initiatives going to kind of get near the City Council to vote a resolution. Because otherwise, it's very hard to put pressure on Congress to do anything. Uh, this, is, this is very, very difficult to just climb up right now. Obviously, we would love to do something out here. If you guys would like to organize something, we would come out and help you in any way that we could to get uh, some sort of a resolution passed uh, requesting the Congress to appoint special prosecutors. And I urge you to consider that as something that we can help you with. Yeah. But do you have any idea for a strategy to um, have people prepared to be on the mass media so that there is maximum awareness created? Yes, we have uh, the National Coalition has formed a media committee. We're going to try to get on there. Uh, and I was on a talk show just yesterday when I was giving a talk out of Rochester. But I have to say it's been tough sledding. Um, the media does, is not excited about covering these events. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, it's just part of the craziness that's going on nowadays. Quick, I have a feeling your question basically is, how come I haven't heard this before? Is that what your question is? Yeah, that's what it is. How come I haven't heard this? Why is anybody talking about it? 
Right. So this is not mainstream. It means you already get to hear about it. Right. And the question is, why isn't it mainstream? This is really important stuff, right? Why isn't anybody talking about it? And I think to that, you, get, you have to answer it. I don't know. I have no idea why, other than there is a climate of fear in the country right now. And that climate of fear is so dense that nothing is getting through. And that's why I think before we will ever be listened to, we have to first get through the Islamophobia. Somebody once said that it's true, that we will not win our battle until we can convince people that they have more to fear from the loss of their civil rights than they do from Muslims. I'm trying to make sense of the United States having a, a president, President Barack Obama, who taught constitutional law, and, 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 then, and then this is going on. Right. Can you help me try to understand that? I think Barack Obama is a great politician. He may not necessarily be a, um, a great reformer of civil rights. In other words, I think he has lined up his issues in a particular way, and he just sees this particular issue, civil rights, torture, um, all the prosecution, all these various abuses, as being down on the bottom of the list because he can't get them through Congress now anyway, and he does, he'll simply stir up Islamophobia. So I think he's just made the political decision, he's not going to do it. In fact, if anything, he'll make it look worse if he wants to be on the other side of the issue. Uh, certainly, we have seen nothing from it indicating that he's open to any of this, but he has any interest in it at all. And in some respects, he's done things that it seems to have made it worse. I, I can't explain it. I don't know. And, and partly it's because Barack Obama, who is who he is, and because he is the uh, perceived to be a person on the left, it makes it very hard for the left to get all upset about it because they're basically getting upset about it as a person that they help get elected. And so it just, it's kind of a roadblock in the way of the dialogue, I think. That's the way I can describe it. This government has been noted as being one of the least transparent of any government we've ever had. Um, the extent of the secrecy is just astonishing. Uh, and it goes all the way back to the torture memos that they were completely incompetent and phony torture memos that were approved by John Yu, which were then classified so nobody could see how phony they were. And it goes right on down, all the way through the clandestine uh, surveillance program, the massive program that is going on now, they're, they're building uh, buildings all over the country to house all the gigantic servers and computers that they need in order to take in all this information, all of which is illegal. Uh, it's illegal because it violates the Fourth Amendment. And, of course, the point is, as long as you cannot object to it, because you can't prove that you didn't, if your rights have been violated, that's, that's fine with that. Uh, in other words, the government, and I'll, I'll give you just a, give an example of this, and I'm going to get to it in a minute. Sort of out of my door. Uh, we, we are, the casino have been uh, surveyed by all sorts of different recording devices. And one way we knew was that the government uh, made a statement that a spokesperson came out and said, oh, our surveillance is really good because it helped cash the mom up and open in the RDC in Iraq. So we're the only person in the country that absolutely know 100% that we had been uh, uh, listened to by this warrantless wiretapping procedure that was illegal. So we went to court and we objected about it. And eventually on appeal, it went up. And on appeal, we filed a brief, the government filed a brief. And then the government filed a secret brief that we weren't allowed to see. And then the government filed a top secret brief that even the prosecutor wasn't allowed to see. And then we argued our case. And then we were excused, and then the prosecutor got in, go in and argued a secret argument before the appeal the court. And the court came down with a decision, and the decision was, well, sure, if you've been illegally wiretapped, yeah, yeah we, we get into this, but you can't prove it. And just because the government, some of the supposed person from the government said you were illegally wiretapped, where does that prove? That doesn't prove anything. We don't have to pay any attention to that. Now, this is an opacity of government that is truly extraordinary. And any time you try to construct a government that opaque, that 
resistance to the truth, that promoting of massive lying, you will have millions. You will have people trying to get the truth out. Um, and that is why, although I understand why people can be upset about what Bradley Manning does, to me he's a hero, because he's doing, what he's doing is opening up a government that we should never have been strength for this, this whole take to begin with. Uh, anyway, that's my take on it. Does that answer your question or not? And what about Brand Bradley Manning's situation? Um, he's an American, a soldier, and apparently it sounds like he's being tortured. Yeah, well, he, he is being tortured. Uh, and he's being tortured in very much the same way that I think a lot of uh, Muslims are being tortured in the SF and under Sam's pre-trial uh, solitary confinement. The big difference between his case and the, the Muslim cases, or in, in fact, some of the people in the deportation centers, is that he's in the army. And the army has its own set of procedures, and it is not 100% clear that the army cannot do that. I mean, there, are, there is a code of military justice, but that really has to do with other people's soldiers. I'm not sure if it applies to our soldiers. It's, it, it's a little bit out of, out of my field, but I've talked to enough lawyers who kind of shake their head and say, I don't know what you can do about it. That is to say, as long as he's in the army, the army is entitled to discipline in their own way. I, I wish I could, I could be more specific, but I think it's an outrage because we know why they're doing it. They're trying to torture him so that he will pray and he will implicate Julian Assange. And they can take him down and then they can close off Wikileaks. And that's one of the few sources we have to actually get truth out of this government.